today we'll be talking about PMH initiatives, so that's Patients Medical Home Initiatives, um, and how we can start to leverage the experience in this group to help us advance those initiatives in Alberta. So we know the EMR is foundational to the patient's medical home. So we want to kind of start talking about how we can start to leverage our EMR experience to help each other. Okay, so before we get started, uh, in case any of you are new or don't know who I am, I am an, an analyst with the Accelerating Change Transformation Team, so that's the ACT team, um, and I am also looking for one or more co-leads. So what is a co-lead? A co-lead is someone who's not from the AMA or the ACT team that can help us kind of shape these meetings to better suit your needs. because. From the AMA, I don't always know what you need on the field. Um, and really the co-lead role can take a lot of different forms. So you choose your involvement. If you are way too nervous about facilitating the meetings, that's fine, I can take the meetings, that's okay. Um, if you're like, my time is really limited, but I would love to give you some feedback. Uh, we can have a really short meeting, maybe once every one or two months. Um, if you're like, I want to be really involved, yeah, we can meet every week, you can help build the PowerPoints, you can help facilitate meetings. Um, it's really up to you. So if anyone's interested, you can always just email me. My email will be at the end of the presentation. Um, email me and we can work together to kind of see what that looks like. Um, so yeah, putting the invite out there, feel free to message. Um, I encourage you to message. So yeah, don't be shy. Okay, so today's agenda. So we've gone through the welcome and introductions. Thank you to everyone who joined today. I'm so happy with the representation. Um, then, so next we'll do a bit of a TELUS update. I'll let you know where things are at there. Then we'll do a quick review of what the current patients medical home initiatives are that ACT is supporting currently. And then we'll open the floor up to you. So I would love to know what initiatives you're working on, which ones you're interested in, which ones you don't really know anything about yet. Um, and then from there, we can start to shape what our future meetings look like. Uh, and I see there's something in the chat here. Oh, thank you, Angel. Yes, my email is in the chat now. So thank you so much for that. Okay, perfect. Okay, so tell us update. So, the baby I have 11 in them too, if you want to try oh, the 11. If people can just mute themselves, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sure you've all seen TELUS's last update email. Um, if you haven't, let me know, I can forward it to you. This is just a quick screenshot of the beginning of it. Um, so essentially the email outlined a timeline for when TELUS customers would be able to um, migrate to the new collaborative health record. Now we did, we do want you to note that we did hear from Alberta Health that TELUS proposed these timelines without actually getting confirmation from Alberta Health that these timelines would actually work. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. They are still working on the timeline, so hopefully those will be confirmed soon. Um, but just don't be surprised if the timelines shift a little bit in the future. Um, and just in terms of those timelines, the reason that there are timelines is that every EMR that's offered in Alberta has to fit certain requirements according to Alberta Health. So that includes things like being connected to um, net care and being integrated with the lab system, things like that. So that's kind of what we're talking about there. Um, the other piece that I'm working on is I've been in contact with Dean Wheatley, in case any of you don't know who he is. He is TELUS's general manager for the Western and Atlantic regions. Um, so he has agreed to speak with this user group and anyone else really who's interested in learning more about TELUS's future plans with the collaborative health record. So I think that will be really valuable. Um, we're still working on timelines for that. So it will come, um, but I'm just not sure when yet. I'm hoping in May, but we'll see uh, kind of what his schedule looks like. And at the same time, I'm also hoping to have someone from TELUS come and give a quick demo of what the collaborative health record looks like, just so that we can have, you guys can have a better idea of what 
um, it entails. I know that we had a quick demo about a month ago um, at the ACT team. And honestly, it looks, it looks really cool. It's very different from other EMRs, um, but I think it has a lot of potential in terms of really having that collaborative piece in there. Um, obviously, that's coming from me having had a really quick demo. So, uh, you know, there's more in depth that we, we didn't get into, but that's just my first impression of the EMR. Uh, Megan, so is Input Health the EMR or CHR? Yeah, good question. So Input Health and CHR are actually the same EMR. I'm not sure why. I don't know if they've changed the name um, to Collaborative Health Record. But yes, Input, they are the same thing. Great question, Megan. Thank you. Any other questions on that topic? Yes, I agree, Diane. I know it's confusing. I think it might be like the other EMRs where you have QHR, Kiro, and like um, Mike Request Health Quest. They might, it might be that input is that first name and then it's collaborative health record or the other way around. But I agree, it does get confusing. Any other questions? And you can keep asking them as we move along. Um, and I am Sarah, hoping, yes, go ahead. Can we just put it, I'm trying to look where I put my hand up. Just a second. Like, oh, oh, here it is. Here it is. I'll raise my hand. Oh, hi, Diane. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'm just, I'm just wondering just a little bit more to that. Do you know what, like, which one they would use when they're talking to clinic managers, et cetera? Because I have found that to be quite confusing um, because the clinics are hearing two different names as well. And so... Um, like is when we're describing just like we would say, oh, Wolf or Med Access, what do they want us to use? Do they want us to use the CHR platform or they want us to use input? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, sorry, I'm just reading Angel's comment. I think it might be like, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say collaborative health record just because that's what TELUS is using in their communications, but I am going to make a note, I will confirm that because I know it can be confusing. And in terms of what TELUS is communicating to clinics, I am unsure. And part of that is because there are so many different TELUS consultants actually talking to the clinics that I'm not sure if they've been given a consistent message to give, but that's something that I will follow up on. Great question. And I think Angel might be right. It might be just that it's Input Health CHR. Thanks, Manit, yeah. So Megan, good question. Do you know if PS Suite is also sunsetting and they will be only focusing on Med Access and this one for from now on? So there has been no official word that PS Suite is sunsetting. Um, if anyone else has heard anything else, please let us know. I personally don't know. Um, my So what we have been told is that CHR will be TELUS's flagship product in Alberta um, and really across Canada. So my assumption is that's the one they'll be focusing most of their efforts on. In, in terms of what they'll do with PS Suite and MedAccess, I am not sure. They might just be sub sub brands of TELUS. Yeah, I'll get back to you on that, Diane. Okay, any other questions? Um, and I'd say if you have any, yes, go ahead, Diane. I just have heard that it isn't, that um, PS isn't sunsetting, but that it will look very different. So I think that they, you know, and I, I think based on for any of us that have been around for a while, you know, we've heard forever that they, oh, no, no, we're not, we're not changing Wolf, we're not sunsetting, we'll keep the three platforms. So I, I think that it's just a stalling tactic, actually. But I have heard that it, that there, it will look very different from what it looks like now. So okay. they're not saying sunsetting, but I think that what they're eventually going to do is there, they will end up with the, you know, like with the best platform of all of the, the tidbits from all of the ones that, you know, work the best and they'll come up with this kind of hybrid. And I think that collaborative health record is the closest that they've gotten to so far because it integrates so many other things. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. And that's where like, we can't say for sure, but I agree that seems to be the model that they're looking at. Um, previously, they were looking at doing that with med access, right? I'm sure many of you know, and now you're right. It looks like they're transit looking at doing that with collaborative health record instead. So we'll see what that looks like. Um, but yes, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually later down the road, people need to migrate to that new platform. Yes, agreed. Minimal disruption would be great. Um, yeah, and then in terms of other specific questions, so I'm going to mute everyone. Okay. Um, in terms of other specific questions, I'm hoping that by having Dean on, we can he can help actually give you answers from Telus's perspective. Um, but there, if there are any other burning questions, ask them now. Okay, and I am going to move us ahead, but if you do come up with any other questions, feel free to interrupt with the chat or raise your hand. Um, okay, so we're going to jump right to a completely different topic now. Um, current PMH initiatives, so patients' medical home initiatives. Um, so here is a quick overview. So on the left-hand side, I've listed the different PMH initiatives that ACT currently supports PCNs and their clinics with. Um, so hopefully you recognize most of them. Um, if you don't, I'm hoping that we can use feedback from this meeting to kind of shape our future meetings around specific initiatives. So if there are specific initiatives that you're really interested in, then we can have a meeting just on that. And I'm hoping that it's not just me presenting, but we can have people say, talk about what they're working on. Um, maybe some tips and tricks that they've come up with. Um, maybe they have questions. So kind of have a sharing session so people can learn from each other. Um, thank you, Rhonda. Yes, this is, so this is a list of the initiatives and the patient's medical home here is made up of different elements. So we have these eight elements here. And what this does is it shows you how different initiatives are related to each element. So they help you build this component of the patient's medical home. Now, not all of these are listed here, but this gives you an idea of what we can do. Um, so for example, access to continuity would be enhanced access. And you can probably pretty easily put them in. Um, and something I want you to pay attention to is if you look under PCN supports, and I know it's really small in the slide, um, but EMR and IT supports is there. So the EMR is foundational to all of these initiatives, all of these elements, right? And so that's what I'm hoping we can do in future meetings is really talk about how we can leverage the EMR to help us with these initiatives. Um, if any of you have done the panel training sessions, you've probably heard over and over again that the EMR is one of those most valuable team members on your team. Um, so I'm hoping that we can help leverage that team member in our meetings together. Okay, so if you do wanna learn more about the different initiatives, what you can do is go to the ACT website um, and under the Patients Medical Home tab, you can see these are all of the elements of the Patients Medical Home. And under each one, it lists the different initiatives. So let's say you wanna know about panel management that's under panel and continuity. Um, another really good resource is PMH change packages. So we've created these change packages for some of the initiatives. Um, and what they do is they list step-by-step step the different things that you'll, you can work on as a team to actually integrate those initiatives in your clinic or in your PCN. Um, and they list resources associated with each of those steps to help you actually work through them. So they're really good step-by-step uh, -step guides. The other place you can go is health system integration, this tab. So this has some um, initiatives that are more wide system. So they're not just within the clinic, but they apply to different linkages, for example, with specialists or the hospital. So for example, hospital to home or home to hospital to home or H2H2H is about linking patients from their patient's medical home to the hospital and then back. Um, 
There's also CII for specialists, uh, opioids, reducing impact of financial strain. So if you're curious, if you're like, I've never heard of that initiative, this is a really good place to go and give you a quick overview um, before we actually maybe get into more depth about those. And then another section I would recommend is the events and training page. So given COVID, we don't have very many coming up. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about panel, for example, we have done panel training before. Um, we are currently doing CII CPAR training, so that's under there. Um, that's a good place to check out if you're interested in getting actual training on certain initiatives. Okay, so I'm going to start with paneling. I'm not going to go through all of the initiatives, but I will go a little bit into paneling. And the reason is that paneling is foundational to all of the initiatives. So without paneling, we don't suggest that anyone starts any other initiatives before getting their paneling processes in place. And so I want to hear from you guys first, because I could tell you why I think paneling is foundational, but I want to know why you might think paneling is foundational. So just think back if you've done paneling before, if you've maybe tried doing an, an initiative without having your paneling processes in place. What did you learn? Um, yeah, just go back into your experience. And if you don't have that kind of experience, that's okay too, no worries. Um, and if someone has an idea that they put down that you agree with, put a check mark next to it or put a stamp or a heart or whatever. Um, so what I will do is I will share a whiteboard and you can put start putting some of the reasons you think paneling is foundational to all the other PMH initiatives in there. And remember that your answers are all anonymous, so we won't know what you put down, so don't be shy. Okay, so we got one in the chat that paneling saves time. Yes, absolutely. So I'll put that one down here. And I can't find my text. So if someone wants to put saves time in there, that would be great. So I can't seem to do it. Perfect. Thank you. So we have reduces duplication of services. Yes, absolutely. If you know your panel, you can really easily know what's been done for each patient. Uh, ensures physicians and patients have a good understanding of attachment, who to turn to for medical issues, et cetera. Absolutely, it gives you a better understanding of your panel. Um, and attachment, we know, is really good for continuity, right? Um, I don't know how many of you are doing CIIC part, but we've heard many times people who see that patients are paneled to more than one physician, which can be an issue. So knowing who the patient's actually attached to helps you figure out who's actually quarterbacking that patient's care, right? Who's actually in charge for that patient? Uh, it's crucial to know who, first who are the patients in your medical home. Absolutely. Know who you're caring for. So this is where it can get interesting because, for example, maybe you'll find out, oh, I have mostly diabetic patients. Maybe that's what I should be focusing on. Maybe I should get a diabetic nurse to help with that. Um, oh. Hmm, no one can see the whiteboard. Okay, let me just see here. Can you see it now? Okay, sorry about that. I must not have shared it. Okay, so panel lets you know who you are responsible for and how you will manage their care. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so yes, it can help you do searches, right? So you can figure out, oh, who's coming in today and what do they need done, right? Um, panel ensures continuity of care, yes, yeah, solidifies a team approach, absolutely. So yeah, that's a good point, actually. So by doing your panel processes, you have to leverage your team, right? And so that forces you to have a team approach to it. So okay, well, who's going to ask the patient who they consider to be their family physician? Who's going to put in the chart that something needs to be done with a certain patient? Who's going to run panel searches? All of those things require a team. Um, shows others you are engaged and everyone wants to be engaged, practice watching their health. Absolutely. It's a really good thing for patients, right? Because they feel like they're more cared for. That's a really good thing from even a business perspective, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm loving all the little stamps on there too. 
provides your demographic info so you know what resources are most appropriate from the PCN and partner resources and care management. Absolutely, yes. Imperative building block and going line up on CIICPAR. That's actually a really good point because yes, you can't go live on CIICPAR unless you have your paneling done. Um, so sometimes it can be an actual barrier to participating in an initiative. Um, and I do know that paneling was not always the foundational step, even at ACT. Um, like years ago, when we first started, we were like, let's do preventative care. And we realized, well, we can't do preventative care if people don't know who their patients are. So that's where we learned, right? And so, yeah, I think it's foundational that you know who your patients are because all the things you said here, right? You can increase that continuity. You know what kinds of patients you have. You can better keep track of your patients, less duplication. Um, we have another one with paneling not happening while during COVID has impacted uh, prevention. That might be what that says. Um, but yes, we have found that paneling is very important during COVID. Um, absolutely. And as the vaccine's rolling out, so I know that we're piloting a vaccine rollout in family physician clinics this week. And so if you tell a clinic, okay, you have this many vaccines, you have to give them out within the next five days, and you can only give them out to patients that meet this, these criteria. If you don't know your panel and you don't have, for example, their demographic information up to date, it's really hard for you to find those patients to call them in and say, hey, we have a vaccine available for you, right? So even, yeah, that's another initiative. That's an example. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. That's great. And we got another one. Oh, preventative care quite natively. It will be interesting to see what the long-term impact this will have on the work that has been happening. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, and that's an interesting thing with COVID it is it has made it more difficult to do preventative care. So yes, we are anticipating not a COVID wave after this is all over, but we're anticipating a wave of patients who have haven't kept up with their preventative care after COVID is over. So yes, it will be very interesting to see what that impact is. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, so now I want to know how are we at paneling currently? And this isn't to, to you know assess you on your paneling skills or how well we're doing on paneling. It's more just out of curiosity. So for example, maybe we need to have a meeting just on paneling to figure out how can we help people do paneling better because it is foundational. Um, so I want you to use your annotate button. So either you'll have an annotate button that looks like this, or you might have to go into this more, the three dots here and find annotate there. Um, but if you could find the draw icon here and just circle, how would you rate your knowledge of paneling processes? So on the scale here, and then how would you rate panel process integration in your clinic slash PCN? So the first is about how much do you know about it? And the second is how well do you think panel processes are actually going in your PCN or clinic? This is all anonymous. So I'm loving the different colors, that's awesome. All right, we have quite a range. So it seems like knowledge is a bit higher than actually them being in place. So actually in the chat, what do you think are some barriers to actually integrating the processes in clinics or PCNs? COVID, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Right now, COVID is a huge barrier, absolutely. Yeah, it's, and, and that's a good point. It's hard to start any new initiative when you're just trying to survive, right? Lack of physician engagement. That's a good one. Yeah, so why do you think physicians aren't engaged? Yeah, barrier to changing established clinic processes. It's really hard to change once you've established certain processes, right? So that change management piece or resistance to change can be a really big one. Limited time, absolutely. Time is always in any clinic, right? It really in healthcare in general, time is always a barrier. Lack of universal EMR. Yeah, Diane, that's a good point. So I think that's where CII CPAR came 
came in, right, was to try to connect all of the EMRs to try to get something like that. But I agree, it would be really nice to have a central system. Docs don't like to change yet. They're sometimes hesitant in someone coming into their clinics. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same as, you know, like you have a certain way that you manage your house. And if suddenly someone were to come in and say, hey, I think you could be doing this and this better. I don't know how well we would respond to that, right? So it is, it's, it can be tricky. Absolutely. Lack of trust. Yeah, that's a, that's a really big one too. So Diane, in terms of lack of trust, do you think, are you talking about maybe CIIC per lack of trust in an external tool like that, or just lack of trust that it will actually work? I think there's lack of trust everywhere. There's lack of trust in the government. There's lack of trust with the PCNs. Um, and then there's, you know, uh, lack of trust just in general with what's going to happen with that information. You know, when we, when they brought in the health information act, which is quite a few years ago now, so I'm kind of dating myself, but <laughs> you know, there was a lot of, um, they they really hit hard to the physicians and staff, et cetera, about the duty of custodians, the liability at that time, you know, the, the, the actual privacy officers in the clinic were actually liable directly themselves and could be sued as well. So, you know, it was, and it was a huge change kind of to, um, you know, how they had been talking before. So, you know, now to have to say, hey, you know, like everybody, you know, kind of has this information already, or there's an, you know, that um, there's a, an assumption from the public that this is, that we're already doing all of this doesn't really fly with them because they still have that kind of in the back of their mind. I think for a lot of the older physicians that, hey, they are responsible as the custodian and it's all well and good until something goes sideways and then they're the ones that are on the hook. So I think that there's some lack of trust there with um, opening up um, specifically around CIC PAR. I think with opening up, um, you know, kind of medical records and medical information that they typically have had the security of housing within their own environment to um, to anyone that has a neck care fob. That's what I, that's, you know, kind of what I am, have heard, um, you know, and, but I do think like, and I, the um, lack of ratification on the last agreement, the tentative agreement, which I think was a surprise for a lot of people kind of highlights um, the, the sentiment out in the community for the government right now and, and Alberta Health. And uh, so anyways, I, I think that I've heard people that have not signed that agreement say, I don't trust them as far as I can throw them because they'll just change it or back out any anyway. So it's, uh, it's interesting. I think that in general, I don't think that the level of animosity is being appreciated. Yeah. And, and you bring up a really good point is, yeah, that vote, I think you're right, surprised a lot of people and it will be interesting to see how that the impact that that has down the line and if Alberta Health can rebuild that trust with physicians, right, which was already not super high to start with. So I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how things go beyond this. And the privacy thing is interesting because it, it's kind of everywhere, right? Like even with more social media and things like Google and, and people tracking everything online, right? It's like, I think it's something that we eventually will have to get used to that our information is kind of out there, but in physician, physician clinics, especially, they haven't had that exposure. So they're almost behind all of that. So it's, it's an interesting shift for sure. Um, and I don't know how we'll deal with it. And what the future will look like. But yeah, thank you, Diane. That was really well said. Anyone else in terms of barriers or um, anything else that you can think of? Maybe even outside of COVID, because I know that COVID and you know the issues with the government right now, those are huge barriers, absolutely. But maybe anything else that you might have noticed before those kind of became hot topics. I think you guys have covered most of them. So that's, that's great. Um, so just 
by you can put yes in the chat or put a thumbs up reaction um how many of you would like a session just on panel or do you think right now the barriers are too high to even talk about it because it seems like your knowledge is pretty high so maybe we don't need a meeting about it but maybe maybe we have a meeting to talk about the barriers and how do we address those right now any thoughts and if you don't want to say your thoughts here, I can always send out a survey afterwards and get your opinions that way. And it can be completely anonymous. Yes, barrier. Thanks. Thanks, Ramid. Or Rhonda. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, we can, we'll do that. Um, and I, I'll think about the timing of that. Because um, I think, and I think barriers we could talk about in a broader sense too, across all initiatives. Um, but yeah, maybe we just have a meeting on barriers. Yeah, and that's a good point, Diane. That's another barrier that's cur currently happening, right? All physicians are suddenly expected to switch EMRs. They're dealing with a lot right now. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, that's a good one, Nancy. Thank you. Yes. How do I identify when a patient is attached or not? We can absolutely go over that. Yeah. Describing the searches. Yes, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Thank you. That gives us a lot to work with. That's great. Um, and so what I'll do is that might be two separate meetings. So we might do one on barriers. I think maybe we'll start with that one. And then we can go into the basics of paneling um, and maybe more advanced features as well. So how do you do searches um, and how do we actually identify whether a patient is attached or not? Because that can be quite complicated, especially because some pa patients can be attached to more than one provider. So we can talk about different scenarios there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Okay, Tanis, patient education, information to the patient center. That's a really good one. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that because I think we're teaching clinics to be more patient centered. So teaching patients why we're doing certain things in a clinic is really important, right? So they're not, so they understand why it's important to be attached to a certain provider because they're half of the equation in terms of deciding who they're attached to, right? So absolutely, Tanis, thank you. Not just in clinic, but general. Yes, absolutely, Diane. Yeah, in terms of continuity, that's, and, and you're right, just education, educating the patient population in general on that, that's going to be a huge piece of the puzzle. Absolutely. Bus stops, commercials. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. And I can bring that up just with an act because they have done that in the past with other things. So yeah, why not? Absolutely, Tannis, billboards too. Yeah. Awesome, thank you everyone. Such great participation today, this is great. Um, okay, so on the next slide that I will show you, um, I have listed all of the initiatives that ACT is helping to support. And I want you to type the name of your PCN next to the initiatives that you are currently working on. Okay, so go ahead and use that annotate again. Um, if you have trouble finding the annotate feature, let me know. I can try to help you. Yes, and money, Diane, absolutely. Money is always, it seems like time and money are always at the top of the list, right? Um, and money, especially now, because so many physicians have lost so much income just during COVID. So that's even more so of an issue now. Yeah. Awesome. It looks like we have... Lots all over the board. Um, and I will just preface, there are some initiatives like RIFs and access to continuity, which are much newer initiatives. So it's not surprising that there's not many people um, doing those. I know St. Albert was doing RIFs, um, I think McLeod River. So those PCNs might not be represented here. But it's great to see across the board, we're seeing lots of different ones. So that's great. So what that tells me is that when we do have meetings on specific ones, we'll have lots of stories to share and tips and tricks and that. So that's great. And I'll leave this up for a little bit longer just so you can keep filling in your answers. Awesome, this is great. I never know what to expect, like how many people are working on what, but it's great to see that people are working on quite a few. And I'm sure you've noticed, those of you working on more than one, they're pretty related, right? So once you have one in place, it's pretty easy to add another one. Population health, thank you, Mosaic, that's great. 
So yeah, population health is interesting because we have some initiatives that relate to population health. So for example, RIFS, which is reducing the impact of financial strain, that would be considered a population health um, initiative, uh, care planning, or sorry, opioid response would be another one. So there are some related to that as well. Okay. I'll just leave it a little longer. I'm still seeing some new ones. And I see patient attachment under others. Yes, absolutely. So that would be tied under the panel processes as well. And CIIC part, that could be related to a couple. So that's where we see lots of overlap between them. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. That's great. Okay, perfect. So we have one more activity, I promise. Um, okay, so now I want you to use a stamp. So that's like the heart and stars, those things. Um, and put them, put a stamp next to the three initiatives that you're most interested in talking about at a future meetings. So that doesn't mean we won't talk about the other ones. It's just trying to prioritize which ones we want to talk about first. Lots of screening and prevention. I, and I feel like that's, yeah, with COVID, that's probably partly why panel processes, H2H2H. Yeah, and H2H2H is very related to a lot of the other initiatives. So that's a really good one to talk about too. And access to continuity is a new one. So many of you might not have even heard about that one, but that would be a, a good one to talk about as well. I'm trying to catch up on the screenings. Better engagement tactics for virtual conversations, yes. That's actually a really interesting one, Rhonda. Thank you for bringing that up. We are working, so actually part of Access to Continuity, one of the modules in there talks about virtual care and how we can integrate that into um, our types of appointments that we offer. And so that would be a really good thing to put into that toolkit is how do we actually engage patients more through virtual appointments? Because that's a good point. They're not in the clinic. You can't just, you know, hand them a requisition form or um, it's harder to get them excited about certain things, right? So awesome. Thank you. So it looks like we have panel processes, screening and prevention, and H2H2H. And I like those actually because panel processes, we'll start with that one. We've already kind of covered that. Um, and that'll be foundational to whatever we talk about next. But screening and prevention, that was the second initiative we ever did with. It was top back when it started, but now ACT. Um, and then H2H2H, that is really important, especially during COVID, right, where we're seeing patients maybe get COVID and end up in the hospital. And how do we bring them back to the patient's medical home after so we can ensure they're cared for appropriately? Um, so perfect. So we'll focus on those first. We will talk about all of them eventually. But since those seem to be top of mind, that's great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so future meetings, and I'm just going to leave the stamps up because they won't interfere too much. Um, so I will be asking for volunteers um, for the upcoming meetings, just to share some stories, and it doesn't have to be anything formal. Um, you don't have to prepare a presentation in advance or anything, but you can just give some really quick tips and tricks um, as to how, you know, maybe you've overcome, we'll talk about barriers first, so I'll focus on that one, but um, how you've overcome certain barriers to engaging physicians in panel processes, um, how you've kind of dealt with COVID during all of that. And yeah, you guys can ask each other questions and find out what other people are doing. And if you don't really know much about it, you can learn more at that meeting, I'm hoping. So um, and then the other question I have is meeting frequency. So how often do you want to have these meetings? Um, so we can do them monthly, every two months, every three months. Uh, if you can just put a one, two, or three in the chat, that would be great. That'll give me an idea of how often you would like them. And then while you're at, at it, let me know if a noon hour works or if you would prefer a morning or afternoon, because I know some of you might have meetings during lunch hours. So um, if you could also just put morning, noon or afternoon in the chat, that would be really helpful. Okay, so I'm seeing every one to two months seems to be popular. So I think just with summer months coming up, maybe we'll do one 
Um, well, yeah, we'll see how TELUS responds in terms of when their availability is. So if we can do that one in May, maybe we'll do something in July, just keep it to every two months during the summer. Um, and then we'll see where we go from there. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so keep those coming in. Um, and the next webinar is what can we expect? Um, so I'll send out some calendar invites based on your feedback today. Thank you again for your participation. Today was awesome. Um, I love getting your feedback and input. So that's great. And I will get back to you on a couple of things. So whether it's CHR and Pert Health or both. Um, and then I'll get back to you about a potential meeting with TELUS. Um, and Diane, I think it would be great if Dr. Hinshaw could add a little disclaimer into her presentation mentioning the importance of having a family physician. Yeah. Hey, I will do my best, Diane, to pass that on. Yes, I don't know how much power we have at the AMA to influence what Dr. Hinshaw says, but we do talk to the Alberta Health, so I can absolutely pass that along. I will do my best because I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. You have a great day as well. Yes. Okay, and if you need to email me, here's my email address again. Um, you can also contact our lovely Leanne Mazur, who can be contacted via the networks at albertadoctors.org. Um, she can forward the email to myself or anyone else that you need to get a hold of. Um, and don't forget to post on the discussion board. Um, if you have any questions for the group, that's a great place to put it or any information to share that's a great place to communicate with your peers. So thank you, everyone. Um, so happy you could join today and have an awesome rest of your day. Enjoy hopefully some nice weather where you're at. And yes, thank you all.